Hello, everyone. Hi there. Um, welcome for joining us uh, for our University of Chicago Crown Family School of Social Work Policy and Practice webinar tonight for building a successful application. Um, very excited because this is actually the first time we are presenting this type of session. Um, very excited to see so many people attending. Um, really curious to hear about the application process. So we'll do sort of a little bit about, you know, a lot of Crown specific things, but kind of also talking a little generally about, you know, what it means to think about applying to a graduate program. Um, I'm Ron Martin, he, him, his, and I'm the Director of Admissions. Um, and today we have several um, guests here as well, joining us from the Admissions Office and Dean of Students Office. So uh, Alea McKessie is here, Assistant Director of Admissions. Uh, Nick Moser and Kayla White, both are students. Nick is in the full-time program, started this autumn, and Kayla is in our Advanced Standing Program. Uh, she started this summer. Um, also will be joining us, uh, Jamal Banks, uh, Assistant Director of Admissions and Emma Toomey, our Admissions Specialist. Um, so they'll be in the chat helping answer questions, field questions. So definitely feel free to ask the questions um, as I'm going through our slides. Um, and then there'll be opportunity at the end of the session. Uh, and I'll probably pause a couple times too, just to sort of answer questions along the way. And then hopefully uh, Nick and Kayla will also be able to maybe help out and answer some questions. Leah is also an alumna of the program. And I think that she may have some thoughts about what the application process is like as well. Okay, so let me get go. Okay, just kind of a little quick overview of Crown. So um, we're one of the oldest schools of social work in the country. Opened in 1908, we were the School of Social Service Administration, and we were an independent uh, institution. Then we affiliated with the University of Chicago in 1920. In 2021, we had a name change to the Crown Family School of Social Work Policy and Practice. And I'm very excited that we are one of the top ranked schools of social work in the country per US News and World Report. Um, and just, just a really kind of quick overview of our three main programs. I'm sure that there's a mix of uh, attendees here who might be interested in any of these three programs. So we have our Master of Art program in Social Work, Social Policy, and Social Administration. It's our foundational program. It's our, it's our social work program. Um, and so what do we do in social work? Um, well, our students, you know, pursue careers and assume leadership roles in diverse areas across a range of social sectors. That can include um, child and family welfare. Um, it can include education, housing, health, treatment and recovery, criminal justice. Um, so it's a whole host of, of different sectors and they cross individual family, community management and policy levels domestically and globally. And our program, it's, it's equivalent to an MSW. What I kind of like to say about the social work program, you know, we're really considering how individuals, families, and communities are impacted by systems and structures of privilege if, and oppression, and then the institutions and policies that inform them. Um, we use research and data to partner with people and with organizations to affect positive change through direct practice and through social, or sorry, through policy creation. Our other master's program, second master's program, is actually relatively new. Our first class came in in 2020, and this is the master's degree in social sector leadership and nonprofit management. Um, for me, I like pointing out that I think the most important, you know, word in this in this title is is really about leadership, and it's for those students who have been working within the social sector or nonprofit realm for you know at least three to five years, give you some foundational experience. Um, who are seeking to advance to position, uh, positions of agency leadership, such as a program manager, a director, or an executive. And what's really interesting about the program is you're sort of thinking about organizations, both how they are working externally, so how they are partnering um, with people and maybe other organizations, but, you know, the work that they do, but you're also considering how um, organizations work internally. So you're thinking about organizational theory, you're thinking of budgets, you're thinking about the sort of like the, the nuts and bolts of how an organization runs. And then we have a doctoral program. Um, PhD also is over 100 years old. Um, and this program, it's really, it's a very research um, heavy sort of like sort of based uh, doctoral program. And so the intent is to prepare students to be um, either faculty or to be in um, thinking about research centers, uh, research policy. So today we're going to talk about, um, you know, 
the application requirements. And so here's just kind of a list. I'm going to talk about each of these individually, um, the application, the transcripts, the candidate statement, the resume, letters of recommendation, and the writing sample. OK, so here's some first thoughts. Um, and I think based on a lot of times, a lot of the questions and I've been doing, you know, I've been working in graduate admissions for, for 20 years or so. Um, and the questions often sort of give me a sense that, you know, applicants are trying to figure out like, what's the, the right way to do an application? Is there a right way to do an application? And honestly, like, not, not exactly. Um, you know, the right way, obviously, is you want to submit all the requested and required materials and in the way that they were requested. You know, that's for certain. That's the right way to do it. But from there, when you're talking about the individual pieces and components of an application, no, there's not necessarily a right way to, to approach those individual pieces. Um, but there can be a lot of best practices. And those are sort of the things that I'll be covering today. And one of the other things I like to point out, you know, we talk about holistic review, and maybe that's a new term for some of you. It's, it's a term we use um, in graduate admissions, enrollment management. And what that means is we're considering all pieces of your application as a collective representation of you academically and professionally. So let sort of like, pro as you're processing that, sort of like the takeaway is thinking there's no one piece. You know, if, if you're not sure about your letters, but you have a really great candidate statement, if you're not sure about your GPA, but look at your resume, you know, we're considering all those things together. There's not really a thing that we're going to see it and go like, oh, no, no way, right? It's, it's, it's really all the pieces come together to build sort of a collective portrait of who you are as an applicant. Okay. So I'm going to start talking about uh, the different requirements. And I'm going to start with the online application. Uh, these are maybe the two easiest ones to kind of address. And so I put them together on the slide. So the online application, you know, take the time to read all the questions. There, are, there may be a lot of questions. Every program, every institution is going to ask different types of questions. Um, and so there's no sort of one way to do an application, like, or there's no one application out there, you know, but definitely take the time for yourself to read all the questions and answer them all as best that you can. Um, here's a, something we offer this question, I think most institutions do, and I definitely think it's really worth um, making sure that you do. So if you encountered any sort of challenges to your academic success um, while you're an undergraduate, or if you were in another grad program and coming through and you want to do this master's program, if you're thinking about the doc program, you know, if there's an opportunity to sort of explain what happened, definitely take that opportunity. Um, I know that our faculty reviewers see that and they take that into consideration. You know, I think all of us, myself included, have had that term where, you know, maybe I did not do, I know that there were terms I did not do the best that I might have. And maybe I can explain that, you know, and I have my reasons and I, and, you know, and just frame it as, as the way, like, I, you know, for myself personally, like maybe I did not spend enough time on my academics and thought a lot about sort of the social environment. And, you know, and I would frame that, you know, I was working my way through college and, you know, I was going through it and, you know, I did not succeed as best I can, but I realized what I was doing and I made changes and now I was successful towards the end, right? So again, just take that opportunity. Um, and then financial aid. <clears throat> Some applications may have a separate application for financial aid consideration. Um, at Crown, um, we have a page within the application itself. So definitely, if you want to be considered for financial aid for scholarships, you know, take some time to sort of complete that as well, as best you can. You know, there are questions that you may not be able to answer, and that's okay. You know, you can leave questions blank. You don't actually have to answer all of them, but definitely do yourself the service of answering them all as best as you can. Um, and it's truthfully as truthfully and as authentically as you can now when it comes to the academic transcripts different programs will ask for different materials in different ways so definitely keep that in mind um, for us we ask for just a uh, just we ask for a copy an unofficial copy of your transcript that you can upload within the application itself so we don't need you to have the institution send us the official one right away um, if there's a, uh, an admission of offer made, we will follow up with you and we will ask for those transcripts later. But for the review process, you only need to um, upload the officials. Uh, at a previous institution I worked at, we asked for all official transcripts, right? So just that's something to keep in mind. 
And also keep in mind deadlines um, when you're requesting transcripts. So if you're uploading your own copy, then you know you have that and you're uploading it. That's you can submit it, you can submit upload and submit with your application. But if you are requesting transcripts to come from an institution, just keep that deadline in mind because there can be time, there can be a delay or lag between when they receive the request, when they send a transcript out, when it arrives to us. Um, now, we'll also sort of have like a, a bit of a period where after the deadline, we know documents may be coming later. Um, this is also true for letters of recommendation. We'll get to that a little later. Um, but know that, you know, if you have submitted your application for one of the deadlines and some of your documents are coming in a little later, we usually have about a week sort of period where we're kind of waiting for those documents and then and we're moving those applications along to the committee. Now. Here's a question that comes up sometimes. Should you submit an early application before your, if you're in school currently, before your fall term grades are posted, or should you wait? There's no kind of right answer to that. I think it depends on how comfortable you are with your current academic history. Now, if you think that you are having an incredibly successful semester and you think, I, I think for myself that waiting for January 15th instead of December 1st is to my benefit because you're going to see the grades I took, then definitely, you know, you could wait till then. If you're confident with what you have completed so far and you want to move ahead because you are interested in receiving that earlier decision, um, and really that's the only difference is between the two application deadlines, those first two, Jan December 1st versus January 15th, it's just when you hear back, um, you will be considered equally, uh, equitably for either term um, for both admission and for school scholarships. So you may consider that. So again, there's there's no sort of right answer here. It's really what you're comfortable with and how you believe, you know, your academics will be represented on your application. This is kind of a big one. I think we spend a lot of time talking about the candidate statement with applicants. So we'll spend some time talking on this. So right near candidate statement. I once heard um, another, like a colleague of mine, uh, give this advice, and I've really enjoyed this. I and so I've been sharing this for like the last 10, 15 years. You know, your candidate statement likely it may be the first thing that you start and the last thing that you finish because you really want to spend the time sort of like honing that, crafting it, and why? Because um, this is your opportunity to best represent and express yourself in your own words. You know, why do you want to pursue the program at Crown? Um, what is it that we do here? That that you want to be you know a part of what are your what are your goals um and so that's why i think you know it's it's worth taking the time to to give yourself the time to write your statement um and definitely a strong piece of advice respond directly to all the statement prompts um as they're given and, and again different programs will have different questions um they may be very similar so you may find that you have a template if you're applying to multiple schools that you have a template that you can use um, but definitely just keep in mind, are you answering, always ask yourself, did I answer that question? Um, and just a side note, if you are applying to multiple institutions, make sure that you read them if you're just changing the name of the institution. It's not the end of the world if you don't, um, but definitely um, just for your own sort of, sort of, you know, mind, um, uh, you know, definitely consider, you know, make sure you read it through. And if you know where you've changed the name of the institution, make sure you go change it for each and every one. Um, so as I was saying about it being the, your opportunity to represent and express yourself, um, you know, some of the things that we see that are successful, you know, drawing connections between your past academic and professional experiences um, to your future career goals. Um, I've had other faculty say, again, there's no one right way and you never know who's going to be reading your application, but, you know, definitely something that I've heard in the past from faculty reviewers is, you know, they like to see growth over time. So again, drawing those connections and understanding what did I learn from this experience? How does it inform what I want to do? Um, how will I move forward? And that's also true when you're thinking about any sort of work, you know, paid or unpaid experiences, volunteer experiences, thinking about, you know, how might they contribute to the classroom? Um, or to a career in the social services realm. Um, but you don't have to have had work in social work or the social human services realm. Um, so you can be working in any number of places. And then how might those experience, like what are the transferable skills or what, what, what skill sets did you learn? Um, how might they be related to supporting a career in the social service realm? Um, one faculty member, for example, um, had said, um, well, it's, it's interesting to see when students have been doing sort of like work, like service work, like 
in a restaurant or in a retail scenario um, because you are, you know, in those roles, you're working with a lot of different types of people who are entering that space with a lot of different sort of mindsets and framing and agendas and, and sort of, so you're, you're kind of working with people. Um, so, you know, those types of experiences too, as you're considering them, you know, could be helpful if you feel that they are helping inform why it is that you want to, uh, this career in social work, social sector leadership, or why you might think you be thinking about you know, a research doctoral program. Okay. Common question that we receive, do I name a specific faculty member in my candidate statement? Um, I, I think it's, I find it really helpful to see that. Um, you know, it's it's not it's not a, a hard yes. It's not a definitely a yes. Um, you know, but I think it can be really helpful. But I wouldn't just drop a name to drop a name, right? Instead, if you're going to talk about faculty members, how is their work related to the work that you want to do? Um, what are they doing that's really interesting, and and how might you learn from them? So so thinking about that, you know, that can be really helpful. Um, the challenge sometimes is, you know, you don't always know, is a faculty member that you mentioned by name going to be, you know, retiring? Are they going to be lead on leave for a, a semester or a year or two? You know, and so that's sort of like the, the flip side of the equation. But I think it's worth, um, I think it's really helpful for faculty reviewers to see like who you're interested in. Um, and then the other thing too, is when you mention faculty members, I think that that's a way of helping the committee see you in the program as well, right? So they kind of have an, a new sense, a different sense, like you've said what you want to do, but knowing that there are faculty members, I think that sort of helps secure like how, how they could see you then engaging within the Crown community. Another question we get is how personal do I get? Um, and this is also sort of like an interesting, tricky sort of question. I mean, we're a school of social work, and I think naturally there is a desire or, or a feeling, a sentiment, if you will, um, to say like, you know, to to talk really personally about yourself. Like you want this school of social work to kind of know who you are as a person. And then we all have experiences in our lives that definitely have impacted us. They've shaped us. They may or may not define us. Um, they, they sort of help guide who we are as people. Um, and I think first and foremost, like I don't want to be glib about it at all. And I don't want to sort of minimize what experiences are um, at all um, because they are very important. Keep in mind, too, that this is you're applying to an academic program, a graduate program. So how do those experiences then relate to your goals? How have they informed your decision, your decision to apply to a school of social work? You know, you don't need to get into all the details. Um, of it, um, but you can certainly reference points in time or specific experience that have had a huge, like a really large impact on you. And, and again, if you're relating it back to you, how does that influence your desire to be in the realm of social work, to pursue a career in social work? They, they can be very helpful. Um, you don't have to. You don't have to be personal at all in that re in that regard, right? So it's kind of really up to you. And again, it's it's back to the second point here on this list. This is your opportunity to best represent and express yourself in your own words. So I think, you know, this is an opportunity for you to kind of use your own judgment about, you know, am I spending too much time on this? Am I addressing it enough? You know, it, there's no one right way to do it. And it really depends on the story that you're telling. Um, so it's a little bit of a vague response, um, but I think it's also an authentic one. It, it really comes down to how are you desiring to represent yourself? Okay. And one last point here on the candidate statement, um, just like to emphasize, you know, the essays of both, it's about both content and comprehension. So read and reread your statement for content and for flow, catch any grammatical errors, um, things that you might have missed during your first read through. So at this point, um, maybe take a break. Are there questions coming through the chat that I, maybe I could answer on any of the topics so far? Nothing in the chat yet. I'm not sure okay. if anyone has anyone that I can mute for real quick, but nothing so far. Okay, fantastic. Well, if anything comes up, definitely share. Oh, uh, one, just, one just came in. Oh, me. fantastic. Okay. Um, so should we be referencing outside studies to emphasize social issues that we want to work in? 
Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, absolutely. You can, you can certainly reference. Um, yeah. 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 I think because also it shows again, this idea of thinking like broadly about systems and structures. So if you're also referencing sort of external things, um, that can be helpful as well. Um, I was just about to say something and I lost my train of thought, but that's okay. Uh, we'll probably come back to it. Okay. Is there an, is, do you have to cite like an APA citation when you were? My goodness, that is exactly what I was just thinking. <laughs> that's so super funny. So that does actually come up. Sometimes some students will put footnotes. Um, they may reference other works and they'll put footnotes. Um, you could do a parenthetical notation. You definitely don't need to put footnotes. Footnotes, you know, it's not sort of an academic paper, so you don't necessarily have to cite sources. It's okay if you do. Um, so so it's it's definitely not a it's not a definitive no, uh, but you certainly don't need to. Um, if you're referencing it within the text, you know, as so and so says in this work, um, reference a thing, and then again relating it to the work that you want to do. Did it have an impact on you? Is it something that really resonates with you? And is that sort of like moving you towards the goal? Then then that's fine. Another one came through kind of similar to the faculty one. Would it be appropriate to name particular courses we would be interested in taking, understanding that the course catalog could change? Absolutely. If, if the, yes, if there are courses that you've said, like you've seen, um, again, you know, we don't always know the schedules over the next couple of years. A lot of them are pretty standard and sort of stable over time. Um, but go back to the slide here for a second. Um, but Yes, definitely. If you'd like to reference courses, please go ahead. Um, yeah, at this point, Nick, Kayla, do you have any sort of thoughts or Leah, like when you were applying to Crown, anything that maybe I didn't mention that you found helpful for yourself? Um, yeah, I would just highlight, like I mentioned a faculty member in my candidate statement. Um, I think mentioning a course is great too. Like, I view that as a great way or a great piece of answering the why crown part, um, right? Because it shows that you've really taken the time, you've looked at the website and there's a faculty member or um, a course that you're really excited about and that's actually drawing you, you know, to this program. Um, so I think that's a great recommendation. Thanks, Nick. Um, and I'll say as far as the question about like outside studies or social issues and things like that, um, my candidate statement was about like the child welfare system and like my thoughts about it's like being punitive and things like that, just because that's something that's important to me. And that's something that I do want to use my master's degree to um, like work to solve or, you know, have a hand in that basically. So that was something that was important to me. I wrote about that and um, I was a little nervous about it because I was like oh I don't know if they'll like be like down with the you know but I was just like okay um, but yeah that was personal to me um, and I did was able to like connect some of the like the way systems work with my own personal life and things like that so um, it was personal but it was also very geared toward like what I was interested in what I want to work in and you know those types of things so hey, thank you Remember when I was applying to grad school, um, I definitely talked about faculty I was interested in working with. Um, and again, sort of framing it in like, well, this is what they do and this is kind of what I want to do. This is what I'm interested in. Um, I ultimately, I don't know that any of it <laughs> came to pass. I don't know that I worked with any of those faculty um, or did any of the things that I was kind of interested in at first. Um, but but definitely, I, I think, and, and again, I just, I felt for myself when I was applying to grad programs that, again, I wanted to sort of demonstrate like how I would fit into the program, like how, how I would show up in the community, how, like I wanted them to to see like I could be there. And for me, that's kind of why I did it. Okay. Okay. All right, let's move to recommenders, selecting recommenders. Um, again, it can be a very daunting uh, process. Um, students or applicants are coming into this process. Some are coming directly out of undergrad or they've been out for just a couple years. Uh, others have been out of school for a while. Um, you know, so how do you think about like, who should you ask? You know, so recommenders, ideally they're people who know you well. Um, it would be able to evaluate your potential for success at, at a graduate level or in the social service realm, right? 
Um, so you don't necessarily, so sometimes this question comes up, like I work in this organization or I'm doing this thing and I have this, like this head of the, of the, of the company, the organization, head of the, whatever, you know, should I ask them because they're thinking, well, they're titled and they know what they're talking about and, but do they know you? Right. So if they don't know you very well, you know, if someone didn't know you very well and asked you for a letter of recommendation, like what would you write about them? So it's kind of, you know, thinking, you know, in terms of that, you know, how would you feel? So um, definitely like think about the people who know you well. So even if they don't necessarily have the title, they can really speak to what your successes are, what your strengths are, um, and think in terms of how successful you might be in a grad program or in the social service realm. You know, those are the people you're kind of thinking about that you will kind of want to approach. Um, and again, the, your recommenders, they're speaking about your academic performance. Um, they could also be talking about research work. So they don't have to be sort of faculty who are thinking in terms of like, well, you did this in this class and I can talk about that. You, They could also be faculty or staff um, supervisors that maybe you did if you were an undergrad and you had a research project or if you're um, working professionally and you've done some research work, um, they can sort of speak to that um, or other professional experiences. Um, so, you know, it, it's pretty broad who you could ask. One thing I would caution against would be like really personal um, recommenders unless they can speak towards your success in a graduate program. Um, in all my years, I definitely have seen sometimes applicants submit letters from, you know, from friends or from sometimes like pastors. I've seen that in the past, you know, and, and they're great sort of character references. Absolutely. Um, but can they really speak to your success in the academic realm and within, you know, the social services? If they can, fantastic. Um, but just be mindful of that, you know, when you're considering who to ask. Um, mentioned this, uh, college instructors or staff, you know, so they don't even have to be faculty, they could be staff working like in a graduate school or a research center. Um, those would be great. They could be employers or supervisors outside of a college experience, a uh, staff member from a volunteer experience. Um, and this is important too. Recommenders do not need to be social work faculty. Um, that question kind of comes up, do I need to get recommenders from the uh, field that I'm going into. And absolutely not. Um, you could be applying to social work um, and have had a very successful sort of experience with a chemistry or a biology teacher, and they can really speak to how you did academically. Um, it could be sociology, it could be social work, you know, absolutely, but they don't need to be. Um, piece of advice, you know, contact your recommenders before you give their name in the application. So just as kind of like a mechanical explanation, um, when you're in the Crown application, um, you're asked to provide the names and contact information for your recommenders. What then happens, you need to supply those names in order to submit your application. And when you save them, what happens is the system automatically sends a, a, a recommendation request to them. So if you don't want our request email to be their first notification that you're asking for a letter, definitely reach out to them first. Um, and you also kind of want to reach out to them first just to make sure that they're able to provide you a letter, um, you know, they and ask early, you know, because sometimes, um, you know, people can be busy and they they may need the time. So if deadlines coming up in December 1st and you're asking for recommenders, you know, right here, you know, just before Thanksgiving, you know, maybe they can get it done, um, you know, hopefully, but if you're, you know, think about the timing um, for when you're asking people to be recommenders. Um, and then here's some other advice too um, that I've given over the years. You know, when you reach out to them, if it's been a while, you know, particularly if they're faculty, they teach a lot of classes, they have a lot of students, you know, definitely sort of send them, you know, a little bit of, you know, reminder information, you know, if you took a class with them, when did you take it? If you did a research project, when was it? Um, was there a grade that you received that you're like, I received an A in this class or a B plus, whatever. Was there a particular sort of research project that you can reference? Like I wrote about this topic and, you know, and you wrote this comment, if you still have the paper, um, or I received this grade in the class overall. You might even consider including a resume just, or, or even a statement about what your goals are are um, for a social work program, sort of depending on who the, the recommender is. Um, so those are sort of things that you can sort of help, help um, yourself prompt the memory of a recommender, like I say, if it's been a while. Um, 
going back just a second. So we we ask for, you know, for it's three letters of recommendation for the social work program, two for social sector leadership, and four for the doctoral program. And going back to the idea that, you know, if it's been a while, um, you know, if you've been out of school for five years, like within the past five years, usually that's what we kind of consider like a recent graduate. Um, sometimes that question comes up, like how long, you know, what do you consider a recent graduate? Um, usually it's within the past five years. And we are preferring to see two academic references and a professional reference. Um, if you think about event standing, something from a, you know, a letter from a field supervisor. But for those of you who have been out and don't have the connections to uh, faculty anymore, you know, again, thinking about who can best sort of represent you and the work you do, your, you know, your potential academic performance, your your potential for research, um, or your potential within the social service realm, like those are all good people. So that, so if you've been out for a while, and you're not sure, like you definitely don't have to stress out about getting a faculty recommender. If you have one, if you have some academic references, that's fantastic. That's great. If you don't, um, and again, going back to the idea of holistic review, um, not having the academic references is not going to sort of ding your application. You know, it, it's about what they're saying. It's about what the content is in the letters. And it's also how do those letters then interplay with sort of all the other documents, your other supporting materials that you're submitting. Um, and again, be sure to inform them of the deadline for submission. Um, I know in our letter um, that we send the, the recommendation request, we include a list of the deadlines. Um, but it's also, it can be helpful that when you reach out to them, that you let them know um, when the deadline is. So that kind of gives them a framing for when they need to complete that. Um, and also, you know, keep in mind that you can ask and if you see, you know, if you're checking in your online portal and you see the letter hasn't arrived yet, you know, definitely reach out to them, you know, gentle reminder that the deadline is coming up. Um, and, you know, there have been cases sometimes when a faculty or a recommender has then said to the applicant, oh, I don't know that I can. Um, maybe I, I won't be able to do it this time. If you need to change your recommender, that's okay. Just reach out to us and we'll sort of work through that process with you. Um, I see my little chat button is popping up with numbers. Are there any questions here that I can answer? There's one, and we've gotten to some of them. Um, there's one about the dual SSL social work. Can there be an overlap with the letters of recommendation? They can. So um, typically, because there's three and two, what we've done in the past is um, we'll, we'll ask the applicant, you know, um, if or sometimes they'll reach out to us and say, you know, ask, can those same letters be used for both? If the recommender has indicated, and there's a little box there with that they see on their end that says, can this letter be used for another program? Um, if they check yes, then we can go sort of walk through a process where we can apply those letters to the social sector application. Um, and if you reach out to us, we can double check that and we can let you know whether they said yes or no, and we can sort of walk through that process. So definitely there's a potential for letters submitted for the social work program, um, if one is applying to a dual program, to be used also by that social sector leadership program. Um, some people feel more confident if they're two sort of separate, you know, they, maybe they want different, you know, letters because they want different recommenders to sort of express like different things about uh, about the programs. And that's fine, too. So you could get, you know, you know, five separate letters, um, but potentially you could just use um, the three that are submitted for social work. Uh, okay, another yeah. another oh, yeah. one that just came up about recommenders. So, yeah. um, someone asked four people for recommendations in case someone did not finish in time. Are there any problems with having four letters? Um, like, should they all respond instead of the required three? No, four is fine. Um, we can accept up to four letters. Um, for the social work. Um, yeah, four, four letters is the limit. Um, so definitely if you would like to put in a fourth name, just in case, absolutely. You can do that. And if we get four letters, then that's great. We get four letters. And if we don't, we'll typically reach out and say, are you cool with just the three that we right. gotten by the, it's like on the deadline or a couple days after the deadline, we'll say, are you cool with the three? And you'll just let us know if that's okay by you. Yeah. Cause sometimes what might happen is, you know, so we don't want to just say, well, we got three and we're done because the letter that's not 
received yet could be the one letter that you're really hoping was to be the one that was read, right? So so we'll sort of reach out to the applicant to say like, okay, yeah, exactly. Or is it okay if we move forward with these three? Or did you want to wait for this one? Is it important, right? And then you can sort of do your own outreach. Um, I believe in the system, you can go back into your application. I think you can send like sort of also like a reminder, but you can send your own personal reminder to them as well. Um, Nick and Kayla, any advice um, how you went about picking your recommenders, successes, challenges? Um, for me, I had very close relationships. I applied um, in undergrad, straight out of undergrad, even though I did take a gap year um, and I deferred my admission. Um, but I was really close with the faculty, the social work faculty at my undergrad institution. Um, um, the director of the field education program was also my advisor, and she was also my professor a couple of times, like a lot of times, actually. Um, so we had like a really close relationship. Um, I was also program was also my professor a lot, and like we were really cool. Like I would go to her and talk about research and things. So it was pretty. It was easy for me because I knew that they would be the ones to ask because we talked about grad school. Um, a lot of times we had those conversations. So that was easier for me. Um, my third letter, however, did come from the director of the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. I worked there um, and like did a lot of programs with underneath that department. And he was kind of like a mentor to me. So there was like a personal aspect there, but there was also like, he was he saw me work, he was my boss. So, um, you know, but those were um, really easy decisions for me. And they were really, really um, prompt and they got them done really quickly. Um, and I use those same three recommenders for the other two programs that I applied to as well. So uh, fantastic. Nick? Um, I I think this is good because I was kind of at the totally other end of the spectrum. Um, I had been out of undergrad for a long time. I was 2016 undergrad. Um, and so I was super nervous about the academic you know, letters, um, I had not done the best job of establishing and then maintaining those relationships. Um, but when I reached out um, to the faculty members that I had had the closest uh, relationships with, I kind of did what, you know, what Ron recommended um, in terms of just giving, a, like, saying this is when I took the class with you and you know this is how I did and this is what I've been up to since I graduated um and I attached my resume as well and you know just said like if you're willing to write it amazing you know if you can't I completely understand um so you know I think faculty expect these requests and mm -hmm. help them out as as best you can so it worked out yeah, I mean, generally, particularly with faculty, you know, they they definitely want students, their past students, um, you know, to be successful. Um, so so I, I think what I find is most faculty are really willing to sort of, you know, take that effort um, to do the effort to do that. So thank you. Uh, Leah, any thoughts from you about any of these topics? So, you know, when you were applying to Crown? Yeah, I'm. I was in a, a much more similar boat to Kayla. I came straight out of undergrad, not psycho, not social work, um, psychology. So, um, one thing that was was helpful. And this was not necessarily my choice, but one of my recommenders was one of my professors. Um, actually required me to do a, like an interview with him. I sent my resume, I sent my statement, but he also like actually spoke to me about you know, what I wanted to do, why social work kind of got into those things as well. So um, not always a, a common thing, but um, if they request or if you want to offer that, it can be really helpful to kind of get, you know, FaceTime with them right before they're writing your letter as well, just to remind them who you are if you're not actually in class, but also just get into some of the things that you may not get into as much if you're in a class with them or just doing academic advising with them um, because they're actually able to hear about, you know, your, your hopes and dreams and what you're looking to do with the program. So that was something that was um, helpful for me. And then outside of that, it was um, supervisors at an internship I did um, and another faculty. So um, pretty straightforward with experience and, and academics. Thank you all. Uh, any questions coming in through the chat that I can answer now at this point? 
Yes, one just came through. Um, so someone is a bit out of school and management is a big part of my current job description. Would it be out of line to have someone I used to manage write a recommendation? That's a good oh, question. interesting. Used to. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, they're, they're not working for you now. So there's no sort of like positionality power sort of issue at play um, because that, you know, that potentially is someone who, you know, saw you in a leadership role, um, saw you um, in a management role, and that could be really super helpful. Like they can give sort of some insights to who you are. Um, and I think that could be a really beneficial uh, recommendation there. Okay. Um, let's see. I think these are the last two topics we're going to cover. Um, so the resume, um, there's no page minimum or maximum. That's probably the question we, I think that we get the most. Um, and again, I, I was talking about this with a candidate statement, but do I include, you know, brief summer jobs, high school experiences, retail work? Um, you know, I'm not going to give a hard no. Um, I think it depends on the program. It depends on kind of what you're thinking about. Like I say, you know, if they are, if they're relevant to sort of social services, if you find like that you maybe reference them in a candidate statement, certainly you can include them on the resume. Um, you know, you could pick and choose sort of which ones you think are the better um, experiences, um, like, you know, volunteer experiences from a while ago. Again, it, it's it's sort of a little bit of a vague answer. It's about you. It's about how you're representing your your past, uh, your work history um, to the committee. So it may be really beneficial to include them as you're thinking about, you know, what did you do in those roles um, or how could, it, you know, how might you talk about them? Um, what's including them? Sort of like what's, what are the bullet point responsibilities? abilities for them. So, so certainly um, you can. Um, how creative do I make my resume and what's the format? You know, there's no format. Um, you know, so the resume, again, it's like, how, how do you want to represent yourself? You know, I personally, I have a very sort of standard sort of looking resume, you know, with my, with my name, um, academic experience, work history, and then sort of like volunteer experiences, presentations, uh, committee work, you know, that sort of stuff. Um, you know, so there's no one format, um, you know, it could be one page, it could be three pages, uh, depending on what you're doing, what your experience has been um so so you know again however you want to represent yourself best uh to the committee um and then a resume or a cv you know a resume typically really focuses on your work history a cv tends to focus more on um, an academic history a cv could potentially like would be possibly more appropriate for uh, a doctoral application, but it's not required. So um, either way, if you submit a resume or a CV, either would be fine for any of the programs. Um, typically, I would say we probably would receive a resume for the master's and potentially a CV for the doctoral program. Um, but again, it, it sort of depends on, on what your sort of goal is for what you're presenting. Um, and then with the writing sample, so I'm not sure how many applicants or potential prospects we might have for the doctoral program, um, but when it comes to the writing sample, um, and for those who are interested in the doctoral program, we did have a webinar on the doctoral program where some of the writing sample questions were also answered. It's on our YouTube page. I'm sure someone will probably drop the, the link to that. Um, but so just a couple things about it, you know, what's the point of the writing sample, you know, so if the faculty, the committee, they're using it to evaluate the strength of your writing quality, uh, the conceptual analytical thinking skills, um, empirical, empirical skills, other qualities relevant to the doctoral training. Um, it's point, um, follow the page limit, you know, any program that is asking for a writing sample. And it's entirely possible that, you know, other master's programs like may ask me asking for a writing sample. Ours don't, but sometimes they do, you know, if they give a page limit, you know, follow that page limit. Um, for us, a common question, and I know the answer of what it is for Crown, I don't know the answer for everyone, but does that include, you know, if there are references or sort of end material, like if it's, if it's that. Um, for us, it's 25 pages of text. Uh, so if you have, you know, additional sort of like, you know, uh, 
uh, bibliography or footnotes or anything like that and notes um, those can come separate like those are not counted as part of the 25. Um, I know that our program says often like okay when we hit 25 pages that's when we kind of stop reading so it's also appropriate it's fine if you have like sort of a 40 page sample if you want to reduce it to 25 pages um, you can certainly do that as well. Um, what you might consider doing is including a cover sheet um, to explain the context context of the sample. So did you write it for a class? Did you, you, were you graded? Was this something that you submitted for publication? You know, what's the context? And so that can sort of help explain what the sample is that they're about to read. Um, I know that that's, that question's come up. You're not required to, um, but I think it could be helpful for the committee just to have that understanding. Um, you know, and definitely papers written for an academic audience are preferred. So something for a classroom, something for school, something you, that you presented, um, or something um, if you're applying for a doctoral program, if you're published in academic journals, definitely something like that. Um, and if it's a co-authored paper, um, you should be noted as the first author paper, you know, because it's when you're submitting a paper where a, a number of people have participated, you know, the committee can't really discern like, well, what was yours? What was theirs? So that, that becomes a little more challenging for the committee. Um, so definitely think about sitting, submitting something that, you know, you wrote um, exclusively if you can, but if something's like really spectacular and you had multiple authors, you know, certainly you could do that as well. Um, sometimes you could submit um, and you can go, it doesn't have to be 25 pages. It's just the limit. So you could conceivably submit a writing sample that's 10 pages, 15 pages, 20 pages. Again, thinking about the first point here, what's the point of what they're evaluating? So is does a 10 page writing sample a 20 page writing sample convey those things that's totally fine um sometimes if you want to submit more than one thing if the total content is 25 pages then that works as well okay Actually, before we get to this i'm just going to mention just a couple other things that i don't have on the slides um for the master's programs, we do not require the GRE. We don't even look at those scores. So sometimes it's, well, people will ask, well, can I submit the scores anyways? I mean, you can, you can put them on the application, but just knowing that on the master's side, um, the faculty reviewers are not going to see those scores. On the doctoral side, it's optional. Uh, and we really mean that, like you you do definitely do not have to. If you submit them, that's great. If you don't, like that is not gonna be considered detrimental by them not being there. Um, but if you feel that the scores are really great and you want them to be seen and you want them to be sort of, you know, recognized as potentially part of the process, then absolutely you can include them, but they're totally optional. So if you, like myself, if your jury scores maybe are not as, high as you wanted them to be, um, you certainly are not required to include them. Um, and then final point, um, going back to the thing about uh, that, the point I was making about financial aid, you know, we it's we have the page within the application, but if you will be applying to uh, federal financial aid, um, you know, we, we often recommend, you know, submit your FAFSA, um, the free application for federal student aid. Um, when you submit your application, if not sooner, you know, if you know you're applying to a place, definitely submit it um, along with the application. Um, the reason for that is if you do then receive an offer of admission, our graduate financial aid office will then, should then have your FAFSA, uh, FAFSA form on record with them. So then when our information sort of, you know, exports into the main student system where the graduate financial aid office can see it, they can more quickly process your whole um, sort of federal loan package. And so you'll receive information about federal loans and your scholarships sooner um, than later. So if you wait for admission, that could just delay when you might hear back from loans. And if you are applying to multiple programs and you probably want decisions as soon as possible to make an informed decision about where you might want to go, um, submitting the FAFSA as early as possible is helpful. Um, currently, they, the government has been reworking the FAFSA, and I believe that it's supposed to be available. I've, I've seen the deadline December 1st. We'll see if that happens, but hopefully it will. Um, if not, then potentially in early December. So you can't submit the FAFSA now, um, I believe. Uh, if I'm wrong, you know, double check, double check my statement, and, and you can check for yourself. Um, go online if you're able to submit, but um, there can be some time. So uh, there would be some time for, in order for you to submit that. Okay.
And then just a reminder on our deadlines. Uh, so typically we have the December 1st deadline for both the, the social work program and the doctoral program. Because it's falling on a Friday, we're going to give uh, the applicant pool, we're going to extend it to the end of day, uh, meaning like 11.59 p.m. Central Time uh, on Monday the 4th, um, just in case there's sort of any uh, issues or challenges with submitting the application, um, you know, so you'll be able to submit over the course of that weekend. Um, you know, that's the deadline, but you can certainly submit your application sooner, you know, before then you don't have to wait till December 1st, you can absolutely apply sooner. Um, we are already in the process, we've received some applications, some have been submitted, and we're sending it to the review committee now. So we definitely have applications already sort of in process. Um, we have the other uh, for social work, it's on the 15th of January, and then April 1st is our final deadline. For those who might be considering one of the part time programs, um, extended evening or part time day, oftentimes we we, we might extend that application uh, deadline until May. It sort of depends on how many applications we received, how much space we have, sort of how things are going. So potentially that deadline could be extended. Um, for social sector leadership, we have the three deadlines. They run a little later, um, sort of recognizing that those who are working within the realm, within the social sector or nonprofit realm, uh, may need um, some time to you know discern, like, you know, can, can I move into this sort of program? Is this a type of program that I could be working and taking on evening, you know, evening and weekends as well? So we have a little time there. Um, oh, and it looks like I forgot to delete that advanced standing thing. There's, I'm sorry, there's no advanced standing for social sector leadership. So that's a little error on my part. Sorry about that. Um, and then for the doctoral program, December 1st, that's the, the one and only deadline that we have for our doctoral program. And like I said, the application is open, open now. And so here's our contact information, um, our names and titles and email addresses. Um, we have opportunities for students to, obviously you can reach out to us directly. Um, we have our generic, our general email um, where you can send an email there. Any of us have access to it. Emma typically is the one sort of managing, sort of like sort of on the front line of responding to those emails. So you may hear from Emma if you email the admissions team. Um, we also have an opportunity for you to book appointments um, with admission staff, but also Nick and Kayla are available are, and our other ambassadors um, are also available um, to take, you know, one on one calls um, so we can talk um, more directly with you about your uh, application uh, if you have any questions um, and then our website. Um, so before I finish up, Nick and Kayla, any sort of kind of thoughts? Uh, final thoughts, comments about any of the any of the things we covered tonight. No, I'm uh, I'm just thinking back to a year ago when I was in <laughs> in all of your shoes. But um, you know, I remember it being really stressful. Um, I was super nervous, and you know, I think that's totally normal. And just like Ron said, you know, it's a holistic process or a review. Um, any one item isn't going to make or break. Um, so just really try and keep that in mind so that you're not too, too worried about any one piece. Um, I would just say because the um, application review process is holistic, um, just remember to like be a person, I guess. This mm -hmm. is the only way that the admissions um office or team will interact with you before you get to crown if you are accepted and decide to go um so just really you know show who you are um you know show what you know what you've done and as best as you possibly can um and you know just leave you know no room for people to guess who you are or you know what mm -hmm. your what your personality is like or what your learning style is or any of those things tell them um it's the perfect opportunity it's their jobs to listen and learn who you are so you know so just you know give them the opportunity to learn who you are and don't leave them like well i don't want you know that's how so yeah thank you so much Aaliyah. thoughts as an alumna yeah oh Aaliyah left thank you Okay, so no thoughts from Leah. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing. I know that we're coming up on time, but I definitely can sort of stay on longer to continue answering any questions. Um, from the the chat box, are there any questions there that uh, we can talk about? Uh, it can answer. 
Um, just a general question about how many applications you receive in a year on um, whether acceptance rate is. I think mm -hmm. on average it's between 500 and 600 applications and our acceptance rate is about 60%. Um, just to clarify, is it correct that we can upload a CV for the master application, but a resume is preferred? Um, don't, don't believe there's a preference. Um, yeah. There's no preference. Great. Well, thank you everyone for attending. Let's say I'm going to sort of stick on and we will stop record. So the session will be, we'll be posting the session to our YouTube page. And so it'll be available later. Um, if you need the slides, we can send those out later too. So uh, thank you everyone for attending and hopefully we see all your applications. We're really excited um, to see all the applications coming through. So I'm going to hit stop record now.